All right, welcome everybody. Welcome back to our final installment of LGBTQ Faith Freedom. And this week we are honored to have a guest with us, Reverend Alex McNeil, who is a member of the uh, Americans United Faith Advisory Council, a partner coach at the Management Center here in DC, and is a PCUSA pastor. Alex received his MDL from Harvard Divinity School and went to undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill. Alice, uh, welcome, and thank you for being with us this week. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you all. All right, all right. So, you know, we, uh, we've had this installment the last, the last couple of weeks, and I, as I was chatting with you before this, I've learned so much, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you here today. So first question I'd like to ask you is tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to the LGBTQ community. Yeah, it's such a, I love the way you phrased that question. It's such a uh, powerful way of asking it. So you know my name, now you know. Uh, let me start with who I am now, and then we can rewind back yes, yes. to where I've been. So how you know me today is I'm Alex, I'm a minister in the PCOSA, uh, as Charles just said, and I am a white, transgender, queer man. And so... You may not know a lot of my history just by looking at me. Um, so I want to make a point of saying that, that I identify as transgender and have been on a gender journey over the past, oh, I don't know, lifetime um, to, to be where I am now, um, seen and read as male. But I was born and raised and grew up in North Carolina. And um, we were a family that moved around a lot when I was growing up. My dad wasn't in the military at the time, but uh, it kind of felt like that we were moving every couple of years, new schools, all that stuff. And for me, the place that always felt like home was my church. Wherever we went, we always found our way to a first Presbyterian church. Um, and I was that kid in handbell choir and youth choir and youth group. I was, I was there, man, in church. It was my place. And as I was finishing high school, we had moved to Asheville, which is where I am now in the mountains of North Carolina. You can see them behind me. Um, I was deeply involved with church and started to get the sense from God that maybe I was called to this ministry thing. Maybe church had been such a home for me that I was called to help it feel like a home for everybody. That was the first way I identified what my sense of calling was. And at the same time, I was in a place of really starting to recognize that I identified as a queer person. Um, the first label I had for that, being raised female um, in the late 90s, like early 2000s, was as a lesbian that was attracted to other women. And um, that was not something that was talked a lot about <laughs> in my part of the world and not a lot in my church either. Um, and at the same time, the ways it had been talked about was there was actually laws in our denomination that prohibited openly LGBTQ folks from being ordained to ministry. So as I was saying yes to my calling, I was also recognizing that the denomination might say no to it, that I, it might not be possible to be ordained. And um, it was from that like God's yes and the community's like, sense of discrimination that got me involved with LGBTQ activism and organizing. When I, when I went to college at UNC Chapel Hill, early 2000s, like again, LGBTQ folks were on campus, but there was a lot of negative and hostile folks also on campus. And so some of my early awareness as a queer person was like, we got to fight to change these policies. We got to fight to change the culture. And as I was saying yes to my calling, I naively thought at 18, like if no one who's LGBTQ had been ordained yet, also not true, some folks had, <laughs> um, but at 18, I didn't know. Um, I was like, maybe I'll be the first, maybe I'll be the first person to, to help change these policies and, and ultimately live out my calling. And it wasn't until three years ago that I was actually ordained to the ministry in the Presbyterian church as the first openly transgender person um, to be ordained, having kind of been out in my process and uh, all the way through. Um, and that was a big moment for me when I realized I may not have been the first mm -hmm. thing, you know, thankfully people had already been ordained before that right. in their own way. But 
I wanted to be the last person for whom it took that long for the church to change to understand uh, that that our gifts were were gifts for the service of the church. Um, and so kind of like what's my connection to the LGBTQ community? It's been part of my political home, a way of understanding and seeing the world and seeing the laws and discrimination that are in place both in the culture and in some of our churches that needed to change. And yet being part of a vibrant, resilient, beautiful community that's found a way when it felt like there was no way. That's, that's beautiful. Beautiful. And congratulations on your, your ordination. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing there. I, uh, as you was talking, you know, I was thinking of things and listening to you and thinking about you saying you're in North Carolina. And many of us uh, have, have heard of the, the, the bills, some of the bills that first came through North Carolina. I'm a sports fan, so I remember, you know, even the all-star game being taken away for, for different things. And so for me, uh, the next question I have is, how do you see faith, freedom, and LGBTQ rights as complementing each other? Uh, we, we know that they've been in conflict with each other in the past, uh, but how do you see them complementing each other now? Yeah. I, again, I love the question of what is the complement to each other, and I want to start with where you where you kind of went just now. Of here, I am in North Carolina. I moved my partner and I moved back, well, back to, for me first time for her <laughs> uh, from DC to North Carolina in 2016, two weeks before the bathroom bills and horrible legislation was passed in North Carolina. It was devastating. I was like, "What in the world have we just like schlepped our stuff?" Um, miles and miles on the interstate for to be here? Um, are we going to be in a place that's just about discrimination? And will I be welcome, let alone trans and queer youth who are figuring out their identities, um, be welcome here? And what was amazing at that moment, with all the, the pain that was going on within our political landscape, it was churches that first called me to say, hey, we don't have to abide by this, right? we can offer spaces for folks to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. We can carve out um, in our own policies and procedures, non-discrimination policies. And I was like, yes, you can, because um, faith and freedom, faith freedom is, can be an incubator for LGBTQ inclusion. It's not always the place of discrimination, although we know the stories of places where it has been, but it's churches and religious communities that have the ability to almost be ahead of where national and state law are in terms of policies of inclusion. And that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look at the separation of church and state as, as a complement to this freedom of exercise of religion, that the freedom of exercise of religion is, is workable and worthwhile as long as church and state are separated because you know, I think we know all too well that the arguments against LGBTQ rights are often based in a religious worldview and tried to be imposed um, through secular legislation. So I think that that's an important place where we as LGBTQ allies and identity folks can be pushing back on where religion is starting to creep in or not even starting is, is more blatantly creeping, creeping into some of our policies. Um, and acknowledging and, and holding this, the beauty is that uh, religious communities can be a place where we actually practice beloved community, where we practice deep inclusion with one another that could ultimately influence in some ways, like what it could look like in our secular world as well. Uh, I like that. I like the fact that you found that the religious segment or the church can actually be the place of, of helping, not just be the place of harm all these times. And uh, I think, and I think you may agree with this, that uh, too many times we allow the religious side to be only uh, cultivated and only held up by one segment of, of different parties, you know, and there are religious people on both sides of this, this issue. And, um, and when I say issue, I say the, the rights, not both sides of this humanity, Right. We are all human beings. So let's stop that. There, there's no argument about that. And, and right. people that try to make that argument are just, you know, uh, are far off and they need to be just over here and get that understanding. 
Um, but there's people on different sides of, of the different issues and the church can play a, a vital role in that. And so uh, you explain how the church played that role sort of like outside and um, allowed you to be able to, uh, to help. But I wanna talk about uh, your theology and how it has uh, influence you. So the question I ask every uh, guest uh, that has been on Voices is, uh, how does your identity inform or influence your theology? And how does your theology influence or inform your identity? Yeah. I love this question. I, I'll stop saying it maybe one day if I love, if I don't love a question, but I've loved everyone. But <laughs> um, I, I think in terms of the ways my identity has influenced my theology is like I shared, you know, as a transgender person, going through a discernment, a, a long journey to understand who I am and recognizing that all along that journey, I am a beloved child of God created divinely in God's image too. It has allowed me to be capable of sitting in holy, the holy mystery of God, to not try and pin God down into one kind of dimension, one kind of characteristic, because I think what a trans journey opened for me is, is that like sacred leap of faith of the unknown um, that I think God calls so many of us, trans or not, into to understand like our relationship with one another, God and human is a sacred mystery. And God, God's self is a sacred mystery, just as trying to pin down any one element of, of our identities is also is a mysterious thing. Like language is not enough to fully encapsulate who we are. I think it opened me up to see where in the Bible, I think particularly there are that, that God does not work exclusively in binaries mm. so we have the creation story um and even in genesis it's less about you know male and female but a spectrum of everything in between which is what our jewish scholars have taught us that like god is actually doing something different than just putting two opposites against each other and god does that all the time um god changes people's names um God puts people in situations where they're suddenly understanding and seeing differently than they had moments before on a, on a, on a dusty road, right? I think my identity helps me to find those stories more and more throughout the Bible and see that as part of the human experience. I, I think the way that my theology has influenced my identity it is back to again that that deep awareness and knowledge that that we are all sacred and beloved creatures of God and part of what God calls us to do is is to be on a journey of evolution transformation deeper awareness and understanding of ourselves and our calling in the world that God is fluid as are we and the way we are inhabiting the world um can can unfold over our lifetime that I never had an illusion of, well, I'm fixed in time. This is how I'll always be. Um, but that my journey with God and and I think all of our journeys, truthfully, are ever evolving. Um, and again, it taught me the value of and holiness of leaps of faith, that we can't always know the outcome. For me, starting hormones, starting my gender transition was deeply scary at first like for months before I started testosterone that eventually like lowered my voice changed my face shape like all the changes you see now I was I was scared that I was going to look in the mirror and not recognize myself what happens if I don't like the changes or what happens if um you know this is not who I'm supposed to be and actually, it was a process of getting to know myself in a more deep, deeper way. Like more of me came to the surface through the process of transitioning. And that's what helped me to realize like God, God created me to be on this journey all along. 
as you know, I, I think one of the things that's uh, important about these conversations is to uh, for people to learn um, and, and be in the moment. For me, it, it took, you know, growing up in the South in Georgia, uh, rural community, you, you can imagine that uh, this type of conversation, even this talk of having a conversation uh, would have been, when I was growing up younger, would have been frowned upon. And, and now it's, it's what I look forward to because I, like you, I, I, I enjoy the, the learning and uh, if all of us are created by, uh, by God, then I can learn more about the creator through God's creation. Um, but there are still some, some questions. And I, again, I want to keep us on uh, theology, but correct me if I'm wrong. What I heard you saying was uh, a little bit of the spirituality that you have on your inside. You wanted your outside to match that. And, and at, at, at a time you were scared that maybe the physical wasn't going to match the, the, the inside, but you knew somewhere in there you find out it was a part of the journey it was a part of what you were supposed to be um throughout is it, it, it am i hearing you correctly when you yeah that's a beautiful way of of kind of encapsulating it that there was there was a longing to to be seen for who i felt i was mm. and that is a spiritual and emotional like that that is like the deepest like all, all all of it is bound up in here our spirit our emotion our our understanding of ourselves um and I didn't I think I had to let go and trust that God was with me as I took those first steps mm-hmm. that I got God is in that transformation of my soul too um this is not something I do alone but that I am accompanied by God and the Holy Spirit um, in that journey. I think that's a that's a connection um, that all of us that have a faith tradition, and maybe even those who don't have a faith tradi- tradition, is we all want to be seen. We want what is the best part of us inside of us to be seen by others on the outside, uh, and that doesn't matter. Uh, that goes from however your sexual identity or your gender or all of that is is a part of who we are as human beings so I thank you for sharing that that aspect of, of that so so that was kind of leading to the to next question because I I, I felt like um, I wanted to ask you what is missing from the conversation when we're discussing uh, LGBTQ uh, rights is there a forgotten segment of the community or is there something that's missing that 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 makes us have this disconnect um Mm. yeah my first thought when i hear that question is who is the we who is the we in having this conversation is it our faith communities is it our secular you know governance like government is it um kind of the the community at large is it our small town communities who's the we because i think that reveals who's missing and what and what is missing and um what i what i would say to that more universally is that often the most marginalized folks of lgbtq experience are missing from the conversation because they happen in rooms where folks aren't invited, welcomed, seen, beloved. Um, so where can we actually be in, not in the conversation, but the listening, the, not the talking part of the conversation, but the listening to folks of experiences beyond our imagining, um, depending on what lens of privilege or identity that we hold. But I think what's also missing and is related to that are the lessons, the wisdom of where LGBTQ folks, what we can teach the world about thriving, what we can teach the world about relationship structures and ways of being family to each other beyond and through and with the blood in our veins and the and the backgrounds we carry, but how do we be family to each other across lines of difference? How do we stay resilient in the face of what feels like impossible odds. 
And there's lots of communities that can teach us those, those stories, but I think so often when the we are people who've had um, more privileged experiences, you know, across different dimensions of difference, that that it's almost like, let me come help you. And and less of what can what can the community teach us um, about ways of being in the world. And so I know in, in faith communities, you know, before uh, I became a, a coach at the management center, I served for eight years at a nonprofit on LGBT inclusion in the Presbyterian church. And so often those conversations were like, how can we get LGBTQ folks in our pews? How can we bring LGBTQ folks into church? And where we really tried to shift folks was, okay, so where, where do we go out to where LGBTQ folks are and be church out there? Um, that where do we recognize that sometimes the most sacred experiences are, are not capital C church, <laughs> that um, there's a lot to experience and learn and witness of LGBTQ life that we'd miss if, if we're too busy with different, like more myopic views of, of what we're defining as the we. Alex, I tell you, <laughs> I'm so grateful uh, for the divine wisdom that you just, uh, mm -hmm. I know everybody listening, hopefully they caught it too, but it really resonated with me. Um, the who is the we? And I think sometimes when we're trying to answer these questions or even in, in a helpful manner, we're trying to say, like, like the church, you were saying, how do we get uh, these people in it? And so first thing is for us to define the we. Yeah. And if we define the we, then we, we can see how we're, the lens we're looking through, uh, the damaged lens we're looking through, um, the, the lenses that are missing from that. And uh, using that, I, I think I'm just going to take that uh, in, in all aspects of, you know, I, I, from the country, we don't steal, we borrow with a purpose. <laughs> but I, I, I was definitely uh, taking that with me and, 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 and keeping that as a uh, way of trying to make sure that uh, not only is there diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in, in the area that I'm in, but understanding that the first part of that is on the person asking the question and understanding who the we is when we're defining that. Uh, I, I just, I was taking, that was good stuff. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed that, Alex, really enjoyed that. So um, we have another question here. And this question is, um, you, you told us about your past. You told us where you are now. Uh, what I'd like to know is, what's your vision of the world that you're working towards in the future? All the work that you're doing in, in, in different partnerships in, in the PCUSA, uh, Americans United, um, yeah. even in, in the community that you're in. What is this all for? What's your vision uh, for the future that you're working towards? Just a small question. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm just like read you my dissertation. Um, <laughs> but here's how I summarize the vision that I'm working for. So as I was saying earlier about how my identity impacts my understanding of God, what I realized is even in the LGBTQ faith movement that for so long, our work was really about letting more people in to the doors of the church, letting more people in to the doors of our office, letting more people in, like, you know, moving from like the explosion and language of identity like recognizing more and more folks included. And that's a beautiful thing. There's one limit to it, is that sometimes welcome and inclusion starts to become a list of ors, like, you know, um, and we're never gonna be able to, to, we don't see what's around the corner. What, what identity is blooming that needs to name itself? Um, and if we've just listicled who's included, then we're gonna miss it because we can't see as God sees. But what I realized in, in doing that work is that what if we refocus our attention on understanding better who God is? And doing some study and reflection, I realized that the project of 
of religion really has been to define who God is. If you look in the Bible, there's how many names for God? Like <laughs> not just names, but characteristics, identities. What that led me to conclude is God is a God of abundance. God is bigger than any one name. If we think about God as the creator as the, of the universe, the universe itself is still expanding. It's getting bigger. So maybe that means God is getting bigger too. And what does it mean if God's the creator of the universe, is, if God is abundant and God is also the creator of us, maybe we too are abundant, that we are bigger than we can ever describe with words, than no one identity can, we're, we're more than a list of characteristics, that there's something sacred in that abundance. So the vision of the world that I'm working towards is that we may all feel, experience this abundant God in our own experience, that we may make the conditions necessary for thriving in an abundant way, and that we can practice abundance with each other that resists scarcity, that resists the pull of, of urgency and product over people, that we recognize the conditions that keep us limited and narrow and work to overturn them for abundant living. That is the big vision I'm working towards, that we can feel abundant and practice abundance in our everyday life with each other, in our policies, in our work, and in our relationships. And that's a constant effort of noticing when we're being pulled back into limited thinking, when we're being pulled back into scarcity, I mean, and, and fear, as I think, like, driving forces of so much ill and harm and pain. And yet, I think it, one of our like sins of humanity is, is taking the easy way, the cheap way of, of um, scarcity versus the inviting way of abundance. And so if we can orient ourselves towards that, I believe our world will be in a much better place and much more aligned with what God is calling us towards. I've been calling you Alex most of this time. Reverend McNeil, thank you for that. That, 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 was, a, that was a sermon there. And that, that, as they say, that will preach. We, we are thankful and grateful for our time with you today. Uh, this has been a, an excellent series. I've learned so much, and I know the people that are watching have, have learned so much. So we just want to thank you, and uh, thank you for your calling, and, and also thank you for uh, being one of our guests in this series. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you all are doing to open hearts, minds, spirits, laws, legislation to change the world for the better. And uh, I know it is tough out there, but we, if we keep the faith and we keep with one another, that better days are coming. Yes, that's what faith, freedom for all means, it actually right. for all. So thank you, everybody that has joined us. Uh, you can find this segment uh, of the series and all of our series, series um, on our YouTube channel. They're also a part of our uh, website on our Facebook Live conversations. Uh, until the next time we, we do this again, I hope you're able to uh, enjoy all of those and uh, go back and review this one again too because Reverend McNeil did a great job of, of helping us understand uh, faith freedom for the LGBTQ community. Uh, take care, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.